Britain will work with the US and Australia in developing nuclear-capable hypersonic weapons after Russia used the deadly high-speed missiles in airstrikes last month during the war in Ukraine. It's part of the formal security pact between the countries known as AUKUS. Remember AUKUS announced a great fanfare last year? A statement from all three leaders of the US, the UK and Australia last night announced a further expansion of the agreement, described as new trilateral cooperation on hypersonics and counter-hypersonic. Well, what on earth does this all mean? Joining me now to hopefully explain this is Dr Peter Chaddock adams NATO historian, journalist and ex-reserve officer. Uh, Welcome to the programme. I suppose we have been talking a lot about the European theatre in the last few weeks and months, for good reason. But uh, beyond NATO, the Pacific matters. And indeed, Australia has very often been a close ally with us, closer to home as well. What does this further cooperation between the US, the UK and Australia really mean? Well, this reflects the switch of UK policy before the uh, Ukraine-Russia war. Um, to interest in the Pacific, uh, and hence, you know, the decision to, to build carriers and so on, um, which is reflecting the rise of China and the security threat it may pose, not just the Asia Pacific region, but a region area, um, but elsewhere around the world. Um, uh, so the original AUKUS uh, arrangement uh, was for the extension of nuclear technology, nuclear submarines, which would benefit Australia in, in the first place. Um, And now that's been extended because um, what we've had is uh, the the Chinese have been uh, developing the hypersonic missile, uh, and we've seen it now demonstrated by the Russians in Ukraine. Uh, And essentially what that is, is a super fast missile. It travels at five times the speed of sound. Um, It can be air launched or ground launched. Uh, And the thing about missiles is that the, uh, the, the key vulnerability was where they were launched from. Um, and if you don't know where they're being launched from or you can move your launcher very quickly, then um, that gives you an advantage as the aggressor. But now it's the missile itself. And this travels so fast, you can barely identify where it's being launched from before it's landing. Um, and it doesn't give you time to intercept it. So whilst the UK doesn't have plans to develop its own at the moment, it does need plans to counter these. So this is the latest evolution in a turn of military technology. Um, And the Australians are interested in this because the the Chinese have developed it. Uh, The United States are very interested and have quietly tested their own. They didn't announce this um, because they didn't want to annoy Russia in the very short term uh, before the Ukraine war started. Um, and the UK now need at least to develop a counter technology, if not the missile itself. So that's the reason why we've gone uh, and extended the AUKUS Pact. Seems like a bit of an arms race between the free world and the unfree world. And it, se- it seems to me, judging by what you were saying, that the unfree world, the Russias and Chinas of this world, had the upper hand until recently on hypersonic weapons. Does this represent finally uh, the US, the UK, Australia, potentially other parts of the, of the free world, of the democratic world, waking up to this? And really, uh, with, the, with the hypersonic, with the counter hypersonic, it, it does seem like we're getting into that arms race territory. Tom, you're absolutely right. Um, we, we are in an arms race. Um, we have been for a while, if we're honest. I, I think, you know, the political will was a, an inclination to perhaps bury their heads in the sand, whilst the tensions, particularly with Russia, increased. Um, but now all the gloves are off. The moment uh, on tw- the 24th of February, Russia invaded with a very aggressive, kinetic, hot war uh, of the kind that no one really expected to happen. We all thought that the the School of International Relations, the rule book of um, war studies that has really been in place since 1945, would hold good. Uh, And Russia ripped all of that up in in a single day. Uh, And, you know, we're now on the 42nd day of uh, the invasion. Uh, And clearly, everybody is watching what is happening in, in Ukraine because a lot of the world's new weapon systems and the will to deploy them and use them 
uh, is unfolding in Ukraine. And so every day there's a new revolution and defense ministries around the world, not just the United States, not just um, the United Kingdom, but the Chinese uh, and everybody else will be uh, are watching this and saying, right, um, what do we need to do that will give us the edge? And partly this is psychological. If we if we say we've now got these weapons in our arsenal, that's an added bit of leverage in international diplomacy and, and, and international talks. So that's the reason why the UK need to be part of this new conversation, this new technology. But the arms race, whether we like it or not, we are definitely there in a sort of turn of the 19th century into the 20th century scenario. And we don't know where that is going to end. It is remarkable how deterrence has come back into our lexicon in a huge, huge way. Ukraine has demonstrated how if you do not have that deterrent, uh, then potentially aggressors will invade. The NATO countries much, much safer for the fact of their weapons, their unity and indeed their nuclear deterrence. Uh, I wonder how different the world would be today if Ukraine had managed to join NATO uh, when it first applied at the end uh, of, the, of the early 2000s. Uh, but I'm afraid we've run to the end of this conversation now. Dr. Peter Chaddock Adams, NATO historian, journalist and ex-reserves officer, thank you so much for talking us through those issues. Really interesting stuff.